He was the State Department official who resigned her job to protest the, uh, the war in Iraq. And she's very active in many progressive anti-war group, including Code Pink. She will be speaking in Berkeley in February, Saturday, February 24th in, at the Redwood Garden, 20, 2951 in Derby Street. Her topic would be breaking the siege of Gaza 2018. To please, there are flyers around, you could pick some flyers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Today, talking today, I just want to say there are two sides to everything. And while I agree with Steve and Janet um, about a lot of things that happen on the board, I do think that in reality, there's a lot of divisiveness on the board, and I think there's divisiveness coming from both sides often. So I guess what I would like to encourage people to do is to actually try to attempt to have real communication. Um, because pointing the finger at other people is really kind of like first grade. Really hasn't led anywhere, hasn't really been helpful. That's kind of where KPFA and Pacifica have been after like, I don't know, how long? 1949? I don't know what they did that back then, but at least 20 years. So um, I think it maybe feels good to think that there's a conspiracy going on, and it feels good to think that there's this going on, but in reality, I think what's going on, and not to say that there, a lot of this stuff hasn't gone on, but, but I think that the people aren't actually so far apart. I do think that what needs to be done, people do need to, to um, be called on stuff, but I think that what more is needed is that people really need to learn how to communicate better. And if, you know, as leftists, I think that should be a vision we all hold, learning how to communicate. I want to, in a way, um, underline some of the things that Janet said. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I'm kind of yes. hard of hearing, so I can't hear myself. But um, some of us who were formerly in UCR um, noticed that um, UCR no longer seems to represent us or possibly its own platform. And that um, in the LSB there are, I think, eight members from UCR, but five of them always vote with the crisis group. And so we have formed a new organization. We plan to run candidates in the upcoming election uh, we have these flyers here. I encourage you to take them. It explains what our organization is, what our principles are. Hold the mic. So stay on the mic. I'm not speaking into the mic. And, um, so um, we, at the bottom, I'll read what it says here at the bottom. Um, we also want to hear from you if you have recommendations for candidates who share our objectives. Please get in touch and let us know how to contact potential candidates or if you have any questions or comments or would like to get more involved at rescuepacifica at gmail.com. And to keep up with what's happening at KPFA and Pacifica, we recommend signing up for updates at Pacifica in exile.org. Uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, the problem at KPFA is uh, not a problem of business management, but it's a problem of content. Uh, for decades, uh, KPFA has been a campaign station for the Democratic Party. And uh, but at least until about 25 years ago, they had few programs that would accept uh, uh, callers to give their opinions. And they were basically tolerant on that. But then they started eliminating them. And the only one left is the one by Philip Mulder, who has a list of banned callers. And that and I'm making up this because I, I talked to many people, but it happened to me also. First, I, I was uh, disconnected, uh, bypassed, uh, cut off. And finally, uh, one day the uh, receptionist told me, oh, Philip said that he's not going to put you on the air. 
of a straightforward. Uh, basically, that they don't have, they don't have uh, a response. They don't have facts that they can defend. And uh, all, it, it has to do with all this fraudulent free speech that goes on in Berkeley. Free speech radio for who? Free speech radio for leeches like Bill Mullary, Chris Welch, Dennis Bernstein, and they stay there for the case and the case. And, and yeah, there's enough free for KPFA because they pay, get paid. And uh, so uh, I think that uh, I, I have here tonight uh, basically personal grievances being uh, out there. Uh, but it is not about, about personal grievances. Uh, they are losing uh, listeners because of the content. Uh, what, what, goes, uh, what can go fine in Berkeley doesn't go fine with, with uh, most of the population outside of, of Berkeley or San Francisco. And uh, so the, the, the fact that uh, the, they might be shut down uh, I'm not going to drop a, a tear about it. Thank you. Um, I'm Carol Wolfley, and I'm a member of the local station board. And I want to thank Steve for organizing this event and everyone who worked on it today to put it together. It's really good to see so many people. I want to talk briefly about programming, governance, and finances. First of all, I think programming at this time is so urgent. We have 220 affiliates, five stations, and a, a time when things are urgent all over in terms of our environment, militarization, police brutality, all of the issues that you're all aware of in this room already. So I think part of it, and there's a new interim um, executive director who came on and you know he was hired maybe there could be some national programming changes national programming improvement i hope all of you will have input into that and that takes me into the next area of governance i hope that there can be uh major changes in governance and that that there can be community input into programming and programming committees and, and that have strength that we can determine what kind of programming. Some of the people on the PMB right now do not care about news. They think news is costly. They think it, it, it um, doesn't make a lot of money, so they're not interested in it. And I think we need to have a message for strong news where people can use audio board all over the country and share news. Third, um, I want, I want to talk about the, well, second, I want to say that Pacifica National Board is highly dysfunctional. I encourage you to go to pacificacalendar.org, I think it is, and listen to those meetings that are so chaotic where they take over an hour and so to, to talk about the minutes um, and arguing about the minutes or the agenda and points of order, and they never get to any content. It, uh, these are huge boards. And, and they're highly dysfunctional. Um, and, and we need new bylaws. Uh, third, I passed out a flyer and I didn't put my name on it, but it was me that wrote it. Um, and I talked there about the very complex situation of Pacifica right now. And it is my best opinion, based on many hours of trying to work with these figures is that we have $9,300,000 debt coming up in the, and obligations in the next two years. Um, over uh, 400. Three minutes. Uh, oh, well, please read the, the flyer and you'll see that um, the debt is very serious and I do not believe that the loans can resolve the situation that we need something more immediate. Hi, um, I'm. 
name is Steve Kessler, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I was been thinking a lot about this uh, notion of that we're having a, uh, doing fundraising, and we have a fundraiser coming up. And I want to hear membership drive. And they're not the same. And the idea is there is a lot of people who may listen, but would listen a lot more carefully if we had some focus. And uh, my, uh, my daughter uh, had a job with the Amalgamated Transit Union. And uh, she's now in graduate school. But anyway, she did that for a few years. And really got me interested about the plight of bus drivers. So I've been talking to the AC Transit bus drivers <coughs> pretty frequently. And then when I go to the city, I talk to the Muni drivers who are in a different union, TWU. And uh, they don't really have any conflicts with one another. they got a lot of problems that they both share. And uh, it's extremely stressful work. But anyway, if we were to have bus drivers, for example, on the air talking about what goes on when you drive a bus, uh, and there's plenty. Um, we could then make presentations at their union hall and I think get some some, uh, some feedback about that. And there's a number of locals around here. Um, and I think that it's, it's something worth uh, pursuing. Uh, the other thing I'll just be briefly I add, add a question um, is, oh, I'm sorry. Um, Hello, my name is uh, my name is uh, Ricardo Ortiz. I'm a, I'm a survivor of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. I was there from uh, September the 4th all the way until October the 20th. And I can tell you that the only uh, means of communication that did survive throughout uh, the hurricane was uh, the radio. Internet service was shut down for uh, you know, months in many areas of the country, uh, those cellulars that you have will be pieces of trash in a tragedy like this because, uh, if, if, you know, uh, if, if, if satellite antennas, they will came down like, uh, you know, pieces of, uh, like matches, you know, so believe me, they are not real realable in a situation like this. Um, I got a couple of questions. Uh, you know, um, it is, some of them are along the lines of, uh, like a couple of people have spoken. Uh, but I'm going to ask uh, Jeff directly and Steve. Uh, do you think that uh, is going on a very intense class struggle within this station that they want to kick people that have uh, more radical politics out of the station to uh, replace them with Democratic Party? You know, sympathizers of uh, you know uh, more or less uh, people that are kind of uh, liberals that do not question the system very much. And uh, my second question is going back there to that gentleman. Uh, yeah, you don't look away. You, <laughs> you know, in, in Pacifica Radio in New York, there is a program called La Hora La, La Voz Latina. And they made that program in Spanish. They make it every uh, Monday. And it was because they didn't involve the community. They forced these people to have a Spanish-speaking uh, you know, program. I know the person that runs that program, Comrade Daniel Vila. So, uh, and actually it's a very politicized uh, uh, you know, radio program. Sometimes I have, you know, listen to things that are produced so-called by our community and you know they sound kind of a liberal you know not very radical to be very honest with you be very honest with you so why don't you if you want to start helping our community i think also we could have uh, some uh, things from the base like youtube uh programs you know things that can be made i just wanted to kind of bring people back um the situation currently is that the 2.2 million dollars that was raised in Los Angeles, and I want to say that it makes me sad. It should have been raised here, and it wasn't. Uh, but the money that was raised by the folks in LA is in an escrow account in Los Angeles. The reason it hasn't been transferred to, ESR, to, to ESRT yet is because there is a negotiation underway 
to get us out of the lease somewhat early before 2020. And if you can do math, we will be saving $10 million a year. Um, it may or may not happen, there's no guarantee, but those conversations have started. And we have someone negotiating for Pacifica who actually knows how to negotiate. So, which helps. <laughs> yeah, we had a previous couple of rounds that did not feature that particular aspect, so that's good. So it may work, may not happen. No guarantees, but that's what's going on. Um, I guess the other thing that I would say is, I realize that you received a piece of paper, and it's fine, all opinions are welcome, but what I want to say is there's a figure being thrown around of $8 million in debts. Um, it's not true. Which is not to say that there aren't debts, there are. But I asked, because I used to be the treasurer of Pacifica, God help me, and when I left, in January of 2014, the debts were around four to four and a half million, and I was like, how the heck did you guys double them so quickly. Please explain. And I got back a piece of paper that purported to explain, and what it explained to me was that over a million dollars of this eight million dollars was the anticipated fees for the cost of a bankruptcy that hadn't been filed. And that $500,000 of it was an extra year of Democracy Now! fees beyond the contract, which ended in 2012, which was just sort of added on. So that's like a million and a half dollars that doesn't exist. Those aren't real debts. Yeah. And so it bothers me that months after we did that, these figures are, are, are still being thrown around. They're not right. In terms of, so that gets you to what? Six million, six and a half million. It's, it's still a really scary number. It's important to say that Pacifica's real estate is worth $10 million, straight up, appraised. We have radio station licenses that are worth 100 million. Normally, you don't go into bankruptcy when your assets are 22 times your liabilities. Three minutes. Have, have I need yeah. three minutes? Okay. Yeah. 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 She can take my three. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. I'm in the last two sentences. I will kind of wrap it up. I'm sorry. I meant to be quicker. Can I give her a minute? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Finish your thoughts. So a bankruptcy judge might have some interesting thoughts about what the heck we think that we're doing. Now we do have to pay six million dollars. That was also the case in 2001. We got democratized government and we got it with six million dollars in debts. And people don't know that. It wasn't talked about as publicly as it should have been. The Pacifica that started with the commute bylaws owed six million dollars. And we did pay off every last bit of it. Um, whether we can do that now, things are different, I don't know. But we have assets 22 times our liabilities, so there should be some way to solve the problem. And again, you know, we can throw around freaky figures, but we have to sort of be reality-based, and we have to understand that something's going to have to go, but we don't have to commit institutional suicide. I don't know about you, before Trump, I did not trust the federal government, after Trump, okay, multiply that 1,000 times, but the upshot is, if I have a choice between the members of Pacifica choosing what happens and the federal judiciary choosing what, ha what happens, I have to pick the first. And I think any community organization has to pick the first. That's it. Hi, I'm, I'm Anthony Fest. I'm a staff member. I did the Sunday News for many years and now I produce the Project Censored show and also a staff representative on the local station board. I guess everybody knows the network's in, in crisis, even worse crisis than usual. A lot of people are blaming WBAI. They go, oh, you know, BAI is, is, is the problem. BAI is the, is the, the millstone around the neck of Pacifica. Get, get rid of WBAI. Um, if you look at WBAI, they do indeed have, have problems in a performance uh, metric. They've got 6,000 subscribers, more or less, in a metro area of 20 million. Wow. That, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that, that's atrocious. You know, if it were up to me, I would, I would send the, the management there packing yesterday. 
But well, let's look at KBFA. We've got about 17,000 subscribers in a listener uh, population, a listening area of about 8 million. So that's better than WBAI, but that's nothing to write home about either. You know, 17,000 out of 8 million in this region that's so famous as, as the cradle of the modern environmental movement, as, as the center of the peace movement, as the center for the labor movement, and, and many others. We only have 17,000 subscribers, you know, something's the matter. So uh, let me suggest some of the things that are wrong. We have all of one uh, half, half an hour of environmental programming a week out of 168 hours in a week. We've only got half an hour of, of dedicated labor programming in a week out of 168 hours. Um, women are half the human race, but there's only a, one hour a week that's produced you know, by and for women. Um, something I looked up the other day, Asian and Asian American people are about 25% of the population of, of the five county Bay Area. And we've got all of one hour a week uh, that's, that's up and for the Asian American community. So there are some problems there. Also, look, look at who has hosted the morning programs over the years. If, you know, I started listening in the early 90s, and as far as I can recall, there has never been a, a morning drive host of Chinese or, or Vietnamese, Japanese, Filipino ancestry. If, if anyone knows about that, please, please tell me. As far as I know, there's never been one. Um, there's only been one, that I can recall, there's only been one Latino or Latina who's ever been on the air in morning drive regularly, and that was Andres Soto. And of course, he was sent packing when, when the morning mix was eliminated by, by an interim manager. So um, those are some of the uh, places where we need to look to improve our programming. Now, people use the word diversity, and it's an okay word, but um, it, it sounds like a virtue. I mean, maybe you have this virtue, or maybe you don't. I would, I would use another word instead, uh, inclusiveness. Because what's, what's the opposite of inclusiveness? Exclusiveness. Does a community radio station want to be exclusive? Of course not. So I say we need to have, as a starting point for gaining new members and for better serving our mission, we need to have more inclusivity. You know, more, more, uh, more women on, on the air, more Asian American people on the air, more queers on the air. And programs dedicated to those communities, and, and including the, the most uh, abused community of all, the two billion or so who are locked up behind bars. So th those are some, some things to think about going down the road. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, kind of offer up some expertise as well. I kind of forgot that piece because uh, I have been doing, uh, I, I, I'm a teacher in after school programs and I collect digital stories uh, from elementary and middle school students. And basically uh, I, st I was able to start a Access SF channel during that time uh, sorry, I started a show on Access SF and basically had the youth uh, showing their program uh, called Street Side Stories uh, for about three years, right? And right now on TV, we also have a channel that it just has a black image on it for some reason, I don't know, right? And so basically what I was gonna suggest, like the gentleman was saying, using YouTube, uh, it ends up that I have to use YouTube at some point, and I ended up creating my own TV internet channel uh, to be able to broadcast out of uh, you know the mission and all these other uh, mobile places. So you can go to, uh, there's a site called Ustream.tv, for example. Uh, Ustream.tv is a very uh, easy, accessible, and reliable source of uh, streaming. Uh, you can do it on your phone. You can do it on your computer, you can do it on your iPad, and basically the idea of Ustream is that it allows you to have more than a thousand viewers for free. Normally after 50 on other websites, you have to pay for viewership. But here on Ustream.tv, you can have up to a thousand people watching you at the same time, right? And then now you're looking at Facebook, and this is where Facebook got their ideas from, uh, in essence of streaming live. Now you see Facebook streaming live too, right? Uh, sometimes they'll have 5K, 5,000 people, 5 million people watching on one little you know, web phone because they're right on the ground, 
right? And so then the other part is that, like the gentleman was saying, you can go to YouTube and start grassroots. Well, guess what? Now, if you do a live stream on Facebook, you can record your live stream and be able to put it on YouTube so that other people later on can see it, right? And then the ability to, for, it, for people to have access to these programs or these information becomes easier because on our website, we only get two weeks on the website right now. Then our archives are taken down and hidden from public because of the music situation. So what I've been doing, sorry, just, uh, so what I've been doing is taking my interviews and just posting the interview as a video on YouTube. So that way it's not just sitting on my computer, it's not just sitting on a KPFA's hard drive, it's actually out on the World Wide Web and people can hear about DACA and what happened two years ago and stuff like that with other interviews that are not being put up on KPFA right now, that are not on the podcast at KPFA because for some reason they don't want us to have that access due to the music maybe, I don't know, but they haven't came up to us and asked us for content. How do we find you on YouTube? Uh, you can check out Setting the Standard. Setting the Standard is the kind of like, you know, the, what I go by, but I'll do a lot of different community work. Turning Point, I did a program last week, Turning Point USA, gets $8 million a year to target uh, leftists, and campuses, students, uh, it's funded by billionaires. When billionaires start to fund fascists uh, to target people, that's a very dangerous sign. And our programming is... Uh, oh, 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 two mics. Okay, our programming is, uh, has to be radicalized, and we have to have more live struggles of what's going on. Uh, you know, it, it is amazing. It is amazing to me that when you have four or five thousand people marching against the fascists in, in the East Bay, two blocks from the station, and we can't cover that live? Something is wrong. Something is that wrong. Because that would have gotten a tremendous audience. We're talking about a deficit or owing five or six million dollars. That's nothing. That's really nothing for the Pacifica Network. If we become a vital force of, of fighting this government, of fighting the attacks on immigrants, of fighting this war of laundering by the government, we can get millions of dollars. But we have to be providing the content so people see what we're doing and what we're about. I mean, the march against the murder of Eric Garner in New York on live stream had two million live viewers. Two million live viewers. There are many struggles going on around this country that we can cover live on an additional channel. It's not a money problem. It's not a technology problem. It can be done now at KPFA and Pacifica, right now. So what we have to do is to fight to make that happen. We have to demand that that be happen. That's our responsibility if we are going to be a vehicle for change in this country, of getting the voices of the people out who need to be heard nationally. And Pacifica, KPFA, they can be that alternative vehicle, not just here, but worldwide. And I was traveling in England and Spain. They're the same problems there. They had a march in England last week of 80,000 people against the attack on NHS. BBC and the capitalist media give 20 seconds to it. They don't interview people. So they have to do the same thing there. They have to provide an alternative channel so that working people and the mass of people can have a voice. What uh, Tom has you know, related to us about the potential at KPFA of having two additional digital channels, we need to fight to make that happen. We need to have to fight new programming, programming of young people from the youth. That could be on a new channel. Uh, in other words, we don't have to get rid of people. We have two channels that we can get new programming on, and we can do it at the cost of $60,000. But there's a political obstacle, and that is there's some people who don't want to change. There's some people who don't believe that we should do multimedia unless it's controlled by paid people. That's not going to happen at uh, KPFA and Pacifica. The fact of the matter is, unless we are providing video, video to young people about the struggles they face, we're not going to get the audience that we deserve. Young people do not listen to radio. That's a fact. They, they listen to this. They watch and listen to this. So if we have live programming on this, of the struggles that are going on against the attack on immigrants, against the 
uh, against the war mongering, uh, against the unemployment and the union busting, and start covering these lives, we'll get a tremendous audience. That's what we have to do. And I think that's what will change the dynamic, will raise the money. We can raise the money nationally and really build the kind of network that we have to be. And that is, is critical. And, and that's why one of the reasons we have this forum. We have to activate people, we have to let them know it is possible to make a change. It's within our grasp. There's a lot of great programming on Pacifica in, in WBA all over the country. Nobody knows about it. We need a Pacifica webpage that has programming from around the country. People don't know outside the Bay Area about these other programs. Why is that? Why is that? So we have to, Pacifica nationally has to have this programming, could, could bring it together and get it out there for people to see. There's programming around the world that we can have on a Pacifica channel that is important. I mean, there's some programs from RT, Chris Hedges. I mean, there are all kinds of programs that could be on our channel. So those are some of the things that we have to work towards, but it requires people getting activated and, and fighting for it. But it's not a money problem, it's not a technology problem, it's a question of priorities. That is really what I see as the political problem and the obstacles. I am the person that's the object of uh, Bill Campisi's uh, lawsuit, although uh, I'm told I have no standing in this uh, lawsuit. Uh, I guess I'm a, uh, I'm a long-standing uh, radio engineering type. Uh, I started it, uh, <clears throat> in radio shop at El Torito High School way back there someplace in the 50s. Uh, I started listening to KPFA in 1954 when one of my friends down the street's mother was the producer of a, uh, a program on KPFA that actually had people smoking marijuana on the air. <laughs> and as a result, uh, KPFA's license was up in the air for something over three years. Uh, they finally got it back. And here we are today. Uh, my recent work <clears throat> uh, this afternoon, if we can get this on the camera, is a method by an existing method. I need to add if the camera can get on this, by which we can add two additional audio channels to the exist existing FM signal, which will be maintained, the FM analog signal and with two digital signals off to the side of it. Uh, you can buy receivers now for about 40, <clears throat> they start at about $40 and go up quite a bit higher. They're also available on new cars and you can also buy uh, receivers to put into existing cars. Uh, there's a few cars that actually come with uh, IBOC receivers uh, as standard equipment. So that's the direction we'd like to uh, KPFA and all of Pacifica to head in as KMUD up, up to the coast has already done and WART has done uh, in Madison, Wisconsin here for the last few years. So we'd like to see management to go in that direction, which would provide <clears throat> uh, extra channels for Spanish language or anything else that we'd like to do with it. So that's about all I have to say. I want to thank you all for coming tonight and uh, joining us in this. And as I said, we want to have more public forums, more debates. Uh, our voices have to be heard and we need a democratic discussion and debate about struggling to build a, a real strong KPFA in Pacifica. Thanks for joining us tonight at this forum. Thank you.